I've learned extremely healthy boundaries. I have learned self-care. I have learned that I can't take care of anybody else's needs unless I'm meeting my own needs, which is extremely huge because I've always been such a giver that I've always put my needs last. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy. Welcome to episode 223. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have an interview with Brooke, who... Oh man, we have so many incredible stories in this in this episode. Yeah. I was just rec- like as I was going to talk about Brooke, the, I was it was all hitting me of all of these memories of this conversation. Should we call it the Quadisode? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> have a little nickname for it. The Quadisode. Yeah, so uh yeah, Brooke has uh explored a lot of different dynamics from being in a monogamous marriage, uh dealing with an emotional infidelity, then swinging, then quads and polyamory and now sort of polyamory but not so intertwined and it's amazing it's in a fantastic conversation so thank you brooke for yes. coming on and sharing and thank you chris i was just gonna say brooke is the metamor to chris who was episode uh 222 last week yeah so thank you to both of you for coming on and sharing your stories and just everything that you have brought to the show we greatly greatly appreciate it and we're excited to get it out there Before we jump into the interview, we do have a a couple of announcements. First up, a huge thank you to our entire Patreon community. We're over 200 patrons now. We're again, again. We were like over. It's like watching the stock market. Woohoo! Oh, woohoo! You shouldn't tell them that. Oh, okay. (laughs) It's just continual growth. So it's just (laughs) woohoo. All right. Scratch that. A huge thank you to our entire community. We're incredibly grateful for each and every one of you. If you're out there looking for community, we do have monthly Q&As, a men's group, women's group, and an ongoing MeWe chat. To find out more, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, and click on the Patreon button. And if you're interested in community, but you don't want to commit to being part of our Patreon community, we do some uh, maybe simpler events to get involved in. Yes. Uh, virtual. Well, I don't know. They're simpler. Patreon's yeah, it's not pretty, that hard. Patreon's pretty straightforward. Lower commitment. <laughs> a two-hour commitment of a virtual meet and greet. We have one coming up on uh, February 24th, and we'll have more of those in March. And on March 4th, we have a virtual trivia, which is going to be sort of a mix of a meet and greet and a trivia event hosted by uh, Sporkle Bar Trivia Company. So we're super excited about that, and we hope to see you on those. Uh, how to sign up for all of these things are on our website, Normalizing Non-Monogamy. Dot com, and you click on the community events tab and you will find all the information for the virtual events. But we also have some in-person events. We do have some in-person events coming up uh, in San Francisco and San Diego. We have a meet and greet and a pole dance events on March 24th and March 26th in San Francisco and a meet and greet and then a art of play event in the park on March 30th and April 2nd in San Diego. And, so, I, and you're wondering, you're going to have sexy play in the park? I don't know. Maybe you should go read about it and find out what it actually is. Yes. And then sign up for it and join us. Also, just a quick note, on the March 26th pole dance class and event, we only have a few spots left. So if you're interested in that, go sign up now. And the last thing we wanted to say before we jump into this amazing interview with Brooke is uh, a quick shout out to one of our favorite affiliate partners, stdcheck.com. This is a service that Emma and I use. We use it regularly to get tested for STIs. We've used it for years. We absolutely love it. And we've gotten so much amazing feedback from other people who have used it. It's fast, it's easy, and it's affordable at about $130 for a 10 panel test. If you use the links on our show, you save $10 and you help support the show. So thank you in advance for doing that, for supporting the show, and for supporting one another by knowing your sexual health uh, STI status. Yes. Just a quick reminder. Where to find the information of how to find those links, Emma. Normalizingnonmonogamy.com. You'll find links there for SE Check 
uh, on the resources page, you'll find links to all the podcast show notes, as well as all of our events and contact us, reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. We would love it. And then you can be like Brooke and Chris and come on the show yourself. Yes. They did nothing other than email us and tell us that they wanted to come on. True. I keep saying yes. I need to change it. So I said true this time. No, you can just say, I agree with you. (laughs) I agree with everything you say, Finn. Nope, not true. (laughs) It's not true. (laughs) All right. Well, let's jump into this. this I do agree with. All right. I will extrapolate that (laughs) soundbite. I agree with every... Just say it one time. Just one time on the record. Let's go talk to Brooke. Welcome, Brooke, to the show. We're excited to have you. We uh, we talked to your, well, your Metamore uh, yesterday. Who knows when this is publishing? It was maybe last week, two weeks ago episode. We don't know yet. But uh, welcome to the show. Um, and your Metamore was Chris, to be clear. All right. Like, <laughs> this is why I don't do this. So anyway. <laughs> do you want me to take it no, from the top? <laughs> no, this is perfect. This is, this is good. This is good stuff. So welcome, Brooke, to the show. We're glad you're here. Thank you for being here. How are you today? Thank you for having me. I'm great. Thank you. Awesome. Do you mind introducing yourself for us? So I stop talking and you take over and with whatever level you're comfortable. And from there, we'll start talking about maybe what your non-monogamous life looks like today and how you got there. Absolutely. Um, my name is Brooke. I'm 49 years old and I've lived, born and raised in Utah. So lived here my whole life. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. And, oh, you got to go ahead, Emma, please. (laughs) I was waiting for you to stop talking. (laughs) I'm going to try. What does your, maybe we'll start here. Like, what does your current relationship dynamic look like? And then we're going to jump back in time. Okay. So I am married. I've been married almost 32 years and I am in a relationship with one partner. And then of course my metamor, Chris, who is ultimately one of my best friends. So... Thank you. How, I mean, when, I guess, when did non-monogamy or alternative style relationships come into your life? Oh, I honestly think my story probably begins in my childhood with, you know, I grew up in a family dynamic where my stepdad had numerous affairs on my mom while I was growing up and I watched her suffer a lot emotionally because of that. And so... I sought out a marriage with the ideal monogamy situation. Um, You know, I'm going to marry this man that will never cheat, that will be completely faithful. And about the eight year mark, my bubble was burst and it was very devastating emotionally for me to find out that, you know, my husband at the time, well, he's still my husband, but um, he had developed a relationship emotionally with another female and it was very traumatizing to me. And I questioned myself then, does monogamy truly even exist? Can anybody be monogamous? And I started really giving a lot of thought to the fact that monogamy is very society driven. I don't think it's natural. I think that you're naturally attracted to many people. And I didn't know about polyamory when we first, it was probably about the 21 year mark of our marriage when we decided to open up our marriage and get into swinging. And so we started out in the swinger community and met several amazing people. Um, Our group was limited who we felt comfortable with and it was going well for about a year. And then we had a couple that we decided to do a play date with that we had taken some time to get to know. And first time we had ever done separate room And it was an extremely traumatizing experience for me. The husband of the couple essentially sexually assaulted me during that play date and it scared me. And so I stepped back from the swinger side of things. And at the time, my husband and I had also developed a really strong friendship that had eventually evolved into a sexual relationship with another couple. And so we, you know, we met with them and they said, Oh, how'd your play date go? And I was adamant. We're done. I'm done. It was a traumatic experience. I never want to do that again. And they seemed very disappointed. So we had a conversation about continuing with them as a sole 
couple that we would play with. And it evolved into a relationship that lasted four and a half years. And that's when I discovered the term for it was polyamory. And so I did quite a bit of research and really learned what that was. And, um, like I mentioned, that relationship lasted four and a half years and things ended because once you're not all on the same page and it's not working for everybody, it tends to add a lot of stress to life. And I think a quad relationship is extremely challenging (laughs) because you've not only got your marital relationship, you've got the friendship relationship with the wife, the boyfriend, girlfriend relationship with the husband, then your husband has the boyfriend, girlfriend relationship with the wife of the other couple. And if it's not all balanced, it, it becomes really a balancing act. And my husband and I had always had the agreement that if it wasn't working for one of us, then it wasn't working for any of us. And that we could have a conversation and decide that things needed to and in the realm of relationship, but not the realm of friendship. And so he had noticed that I was struggling immensely and my partner had started to shut down quite a bit based off of some insecurities of his spouse. And so it really took a toll and our relationship devolved and started to struggle quite a bit. And so we gave it some time to kind of work the bugs out and they didn't. And so we chose to have a conversation to end things, um, within the sexual dynamic of the relationship. And sad to say that did not go over very well with the wife of the other couple. And so it put a huge strain on the friendship. And unfortunately it, it ended for several years as far as the friendship goes. Um, It was a few months later, we had met another couple and had started to hang out with them. They actually approached us. They had been exploring the hot wife stag dynamic and they were having some struggles and wanted to kind of talk to somebody that had been living the open relationship lifestyle for quite a while and things evolved from there. And that led into another relationship with them as a quad couple that lasted three years and really good initially, but as all things come to light, you start to learn true colors of people. And we discovered it was a very unhealthy relationship. Um, it actually almost ended my marriage to my husband because of some feelings of loyalty and disrespect that was happening. Um, I tend to be the type of person that I overinvest in everything, including friendship And so I found myself giving and giving and giving with no return. And it got to the point where it was extremely hurtful and, um, we had ended, I ended things. I'll be very honest. I, I had a knee jerk reaction at a situation and I messaged everybody and said, we're done. And of course my husband was taken aback that I would do that without consulting him. And at that point he was having what he needed met in that relationship, I very much was not having what I needed met. And so he was determined he was going to continue that with or without me, which at the time was extremely hurtful because, you know, I'd expressed to him, I thought we had a rule that if it didn't work for one, it didn't work for any. And why aren't you willing to follow that rule? And his response was, well, the rules have changed which was even more hurtful (laughs) because it hadn't been discussed. Um, And I started therapy around that time. Um, We had experienced a lot of loss during the time with the second couple. We had lost a grandson. Um, My husband's father had passed away and then my husband's brother had passed away. So we were really struggling and it had raised a lot of abandonment issues for me from childhood trauma And so I began therapy and I was seeing a therapist and she encouraged, you know, let's do some couple sessions. And my husband was very resistant to the idea and he reluctantly went along with a few sessions, which taught me some key things. Um, My therapist did happen to say, 
in one of those couple sessions, if this dynamic is not working for you, then you have every right to go out and find something that does work for you. You don't have to be a part of this relationship just because your husband is. And so that really struck deep with me that I could actually choose for myself something that would work for me. And we had ended up ending the relationship the following year, which would have been 2020. Um, It was the fall of 2020. And this time around, when it actually truly ended, it was the wife of the other couple that actually basically blew everything up. And it was a lot of stress to watch my husband go through the emotional pain that um, she essentially ended up putting onto him. Um, he was very invested in that relationship and thought it was working well. And when it came right down to it, she had been seeing someone else for quite some time without really letting anyone know, which for me was a major concern because our philosophy is once you're in a committed relationship and you're comfortable, that's when our rule of protection required actually can go on the shelf is you're in this committed relationship and you know who's involved with who. And at that point in time, I raised some concerns that we don't know who she's been with and she's still participating in this dynamic with us as if it's just the four of us involved. And it's, you know, my, my sexual health is very important to me. And so it became a major concern that I couldn't let go. And that frustrated him even more. Um, but we tried to remain friends and went to dinner a couple of times after the breakup. And then it became very apparent the toxic level that was involved with her. And we were able to still remain friends with the husband. And he had, he has some issues with alcohol. He's actually detoxing right now um, for the second attempt. And He was trying to detox then, and he ended up losing a job due to alcohol, and she felt like I had made it very clear that I was there to support him as a friend and didn't reach out to her, and um, it just, that relationship devolved from there because it came to a point where the husband wasn't even allowed to be friends with me for several months. She kind of laid the line down, and so that was hurtful, and um, we're friends now with him again. Um, he started reaching back out about three months after the friendship was, I guess, canceled. (laughs) I guess that's the best term to put it on. Um, and so we've been good friends and I'm in a position right now, thankfully that with a supportive husband and a supportive partner that I have in Brad, they have allowed me to be that friend to, my former partner in helping him through this detox. And so that's been a challenge, but it's been good. Um, in November of 20, I lost my mother to COVID, which was extremely stressful and a very emotional time for me. And at that time, um, and I'm on a few poly pages, Brad had seen me post an intro of myself and, he made a comment on there and I reached out to him the week of planning my mom's funeral and just said, Hey, I appreciate your interest. It's just not a good week for me. This is what's going on in my life. And he said, not a problem. You just take care of you and what you need to do and reach out when you're ready. And so we chatted for probably, what would you say, Brad, three months, almost three months. And he invited me to dinner And keeping in mind, I've been married almost 32 years, so I've never done like the official dating thing. I met my husband in high school, high school dances, the partners we were with before, just it was never dating. And so to be, you know, asked out by Brad, hey, do you want to go get dinner? I freaked out. I ran across the hall and said to my husband, I think this guy's asking me out. And he said, well, I think you should go. And so as they say, it all went down in the history books from there. We've been what, eight months, about About eight months of officially dating. And I would say 
seven months of probably classifying us officially as partners. And through Brad, I met Chris, who is amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, I would say that through therapy and through Brad and through Chris, I've learned extremely healthy boundaries. I have learned self-care. I have learned that I can't take care of anybody else's needs unless I'm meeting my own needs, which is extremely huge because I've always been such a giver that I've always put my needs last. And so they've been amazing teachers. I would say my first two poly relationships would be classified as extremely unhealthy with very toxic metas and not the right fit with partners. And in the beginning, I told Chris over and over, why are you being so nice to me? Why are you interested in my success with Brad? And she just kept saying to me, this is how it's supposed to be. And I'm like, I've never known anything like this. I've only known the toxic side where there was manipulation and deceiving. And, um, it just, it, I went into it with my guard up And it was very difficult to become vulnerable because my guard was so elevated. And I would have conversations with Chris and I would say, I need to talk to Brad about this, but I don't know what to say. And she's like, you just say it. And I said, well, that's easy for you to say, but I've never been in a relationship, even in my marriage, where I could just say it without there being some sort of repercussion or fallout, not really a safe environment to have in-depth conversations. And that's when I discovered through Chris that you can be vulnerable in a safe environment. And um, I was able to have a topic of conversation with Brad probably about two and a half months ago, um, where I just expressed, you know, this is a boundary for me and I'm just not willing to compromise my moral values that I you know, this person that he had had a friendship with, um, I also was friends with and had been investing, um, myself and little to no return on that and watched as she went through some life struggles and realized that her moral values do definitely not align with mine. And I was able to express that to Brad and just say, I want you to feel supported in that friendship, but I don't, I can't, have that around me anymore. So I would appreciate it if you wouldn't talk about her, if you wouldn't bring her up as a topic of conversation, because it just sets my anxiety on edge. And he made it a very safe space to have that discussion. And I think that that's probably where our relationship took a big turn with um, just feeling closer and more vulnerable with each other and a safe space to do that in. So... Well, that, thank you. That was quite the, the, the recap, um, or the, not the recap, the story, the history, History. the history, the short version of the history. And and our our condolences to to you and and your husband about his losses and and yours as well. And also like, just so sorry about your first experience in that traumatic sexual assault, like Mm -hmm. that shit is so hard. Um, so the, the fact yeah. that, that you continued, continued on is just, uh, it's amazing. Um, yeah. and I, I mean, I know there's a ton that I want to ask about and talk about, yeah. and I'm sure Emma as well. I had, I had one clarifying question yes. and then, and I wanted to just like recap a little bit first, but go ahead. You go first. Okay. Well, maybe this will help with the recap. Um, the second couple, when you said, I, you, you sent the, 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 what you said, the knee jerk email or in text message and said, Hey, we're done. It sounds like it wasn't like done, done. Um, at that point, did you continue with the other guy or did your husband just continue with the other woman? And you continued with the guy, like as a support, as a friend, like what did, after that email, what, or that text message, what happened? It was... Okay. How do I explain this? (laughs) Um, I was never in either relationship ultimately in the beginning as my own choice. 
right? Positive things came out of it. Like these were very much couples that my husband had had an attraction to the female and wanted to develop that relationship. And it did evolve into long-term relationships with both. And I did find positive connections with both partners, but ultimately neither of those relationships fulfilled the needs that I had. Um, there just wasn't maturity. There wasn't, there was not intellectual conversations. It was purely about, oh, let's just entertain each other while our spouses kind of do their thing. Um, I went back into that relationship. It took about probably five months to get things back on track. And I knew my husband wanted to continue. I knew I for sure wanted the friendship with both of them at the time and let it naturally evolve back into a sexual dynamic. The thought in the back of my head the entire time was, I'm going to just ride this out until it naturally destructs because I knew it wasn't healthy and I knew it was a matter of time before the relationship ended. And I'm not trying to toot my own horn in any way, but out of the four people in each of the two dynamics, I'm the best communicator out of the four. So when I would push for conversations Nobody wanted to have the hard conversations. Nobody wanted to discuss the issues at hand. And that became a very big challenge for me. And because I was pushing for those conversations to happen, and I'm huge on people taking accountability for their contributions to things. And that's not something that happened in either of those relationships. It became that I was the focus and the one to blame for those relationships not working out. And so in that second dynamic, I felt like, okay, well, I blew this out of the water and it's going to take some healing time, but you know, my husband's still interested and wants us to continue. So if I just write it out and let somebody else discover that, okay, this is not healthy and somebody else ends it, then I'm off the hook and I'm no longer the one to blame. Carrying that blame can be very taxing emotionally. (laughs) So That's where I think my relationship with Brad and Chris is as successful as it is because we all communicate and it's not Chris saying to Brad, well, Brooke does this or me saying to Brad, well, Chris does this. It's Chris and I talking saying, Hey, I need to talk to you about something. Can we have a conversation? Chris and I talk every single day. We chat throughout the day. If we're not talking on the phone at least twice during the day, it's very, very odd And I don't usually have weekend time with Brad. Um, Obviously, I have my husband, who's my primary nesting partner. And so um, my time is typically during the week with Brad. And so on weekends, he's usually with Chris, which means on weekends, I'm not talking to either one of them a whole lot. And so I tell Chris by Monday morning, I'm going through withdrawals and I'm on the phone with her at 830 in the morning. So yeah, we've, we've got a really good friendship that both of us are invested in seeing Brad happy and seeing each other happy. I would say the biggest thing I've learned from Chris and Brad both is compersion for your partners. And so I think my previous two dynamics, it was very much, I wasn't feeling fulfilled completely. And so it was hard for me to want that happiness for my husband because I wasn't getting it myself. And now I've evolved to a point where I would never, ever imagine telling Brad, I don't want you to see that person. I don't want you to be with that person. So why would I do that with my own husband? Because ultimately he deserves for me to want happiness for him. And Mm -hmm. so things have been a struggle for him since the breakup. Um, He's had a hard time making connections. We have found that if you're dating separately, which is what we do now, it's a lot easier for women than it is for men to make those connections. So he's had some real emotional struggles over it and has finally found somebody that they're not necessarily in a partnership, but they're definitely evolving a relationship. And it's somebody that we've known for decades and she's very good for his mental health. And she's such a good friend to me that it's healthy, like what I have with Chris. And I'm able to recognize that because of my relationship with Chris. And so I'm able to encourage him not only in that developing relationship, but with any situation that he wants to be involved with. So 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Love it. That's amazing that it's kind of come, I mean, obviously not the easiest way to get there, but, but it sounds like you two have landed in a much healthier, balanced dynamic that works better for the, for the two of you and for your, your partners. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I wanted to just do a, a really quick recap from everything you said, because you, you've had different, um, I've, you have explored different types of non-monogamy throughout your, your marriage. And, you know, it started back in your childhood, you know, witnessing, like you want that secure, uh, uh well, you want that relationship that is, where both of you are monogamous. And so you go to, you go and find that and you do that. And then eight years in there's an infidelity and you have to navigate that. And then a handful of years later that after that, you decide to open up your relationship, go down the swinging route. And that's when the sexual assault happened. And then you have to go and try, like you keep going and you end up in a polyamorous quad. And then that one ends after four and a half years. And then you're in another polyamorous quad (laughs) and that one ends after some time as well. And what you just explained um, is a little bit maybe different of an ending than the first one. And now you're in a, in this polyamorous relation in these polyamorous relationships where you're dating separately with your husband. And wow, that is quite the journey. (laughs) So, um, but I'm, it sounds like from what, from what I'm hearing that you say that where you feel like you're at now is really the healthiest place for both you and your husband and your partners. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would say that when I went into the mindset of saying, you know, when we had the conversation about swinging, my ultimate mentality at that time was, you know, we had, we'd approached some struggles with each other. And I felt like, you know, if we go about it this route, at least I know where my husband's at, who he's with. I won't be blindsided. It won't come as a surprise to me. I won't be the last to know. So that was the mentality coming from a position of some infidelity into evolving into ethical non-monogamy. It, that was my mindset initially. And now being truly poly, I can't imagine, I guess my philosophy now is I can never be the person to provide every single need a hundred percent for my husband and have him feel completely fulfilled. Just like he can't do that for me. There are gaps. We both have different personalities. His emotions are different than mine. He communicates very differently than I do. And so what Brad's able to do for me as my partner, he fills those areas. And then somewhere Steve after 32 years, I know he's not going to grow into that for me. And so I feel like I'm truly poly. I love multiple people. I'm able to balance it and make sure that both my husband and my partner's needs that I feel like I'm meeting them. And I feel definitely more fulfilled. And again, numerous times I've said to Chris, I don't know how I got so lucky and this is just working out so well. And she, Chris will probably be the better one to say how much I've grown in the last year, because I do see some growth, but she's telling me all the time you've really grown. Like just, I've had some situations with the former partners where I've had to really put into place some boundaries and because I've catered to them for so long, some of those boundaries are very hard to stand on. And, um, the wife from the first couple, we had developed back into a friendship with them at the beginning of the year, just trying to get on a ground of friendship and things had evolved into more than that. And, um, that partner, um, the first partner that I had had just said, I don't want a relationship. I just, am good with friends with benefits. And I said, Hey, great. Me too. That's all I want. And it had evolved with things with Brad. And then this particular former partner said, well, I've changed my mind. I want a relationship. And I said, well, we need to talk about that. Great that you've decided that, but my feelings matter too. And so we talked about it and I said, you know, what does it mean to you to have a relationship? And he said, well, I would be loyal to you and I would want you to be loyal to me. And I said, so you want me to stop seeing Brad? And he said, I would prefer it. And I said, well, it's not going to happen. And that created a lot of frustration for him. And it ended up ending our friendship completely. 
Um, I had to instill some boundaries with him and I've had to stand by them, which has been difficult, but rewarding at the same time. And his wife is still in a dating scenario with my husband, which I've told my husband as of just a couple weeks ago, I will support you in this, but I've put up some boundaries and I can't communicate with her any longer because of lack of accountability and a lot of pressure from her. There's been a lot of pressure from her this year to just reach out and reconcile, just make that friendship what it ultimately in my mind, she wants to have smooth waters to make it easier for herself to pursue the relationship. And, um, Chris taught me another valuable lesson and you'll hear that a lot. Chris has taught me a lot. Um, she told me one day, she goes, this is not your relationship to navigate. This is your husband's and her relationship to navigate. And so you need to just let them do that and step completely out of it. And if that means that you have to put a boundary in place with her, then you have to do that. And it got to that point because this person that my husband is developing a relationship with has also been her friend. And my husband felt he needed to communicate with her. Um, He had started out the conversation with her by saying, you know, I've told you this all along this year that you're not my only person that I will interact with. And I've told you that what I do is not your business. It's my business, but I feel in this situation, I need to be honest with you and tell you that I'm seeing this person and she did not handle it. Well, it became another toxic situation and took about two weeks for her to even have a conversation about what was going on and, Um, unfortunately that conversation came in the way of her reaching out to me and putting expectations on me to fix it. And I just had explained to her, this is not my relationship to fix. I'm not involved in this relationship. You need to be accountable for your reaction to the news and apologies are probably in order by both of you. And unfortunately it became a very big lack of accountability and a lot of pressure that I ended up having to tell her, please do not message me anymore. I don't want you to communicate with me. I need some space. And that did not end the messaging. She's messaged probably seven times since, and I've just ignored them. I haven't responded. Um, I have let my husband know just so that you are aware this is a boundary I've put in place and she's not adhering to it. She's showing a complete lack of respect to what I've asked her. And so I'm choosing not to respond. Um, I, and and this is the most difficult part for me is I'm the type of person that if a compliment is paid, it's difficult for me not to acknowledge it and say, thank you. And she had reached out last week. We had a grandbaby that was born and she reached out saying, congratulations. And I didn't respond. And it was tough not to say thank you, but at the same time, I needed her to understand that this is a firm boundary. And she's not respecting me enough to listen to it. And so that's kind of where things sit with that relationship right now. Um, Trying to just ultimately ensure that the people that I let into my energy circle are positive for me. I don't want toxicity. I want maturity. And that's probably the biggest thing that Chris tells me. This is how it's supposed to be this is what I want is how it's supposed to be, how it's healthy. And, you know, you're mature and you communicate about things with each other instead of with your partners about the other partner. And so that's been a big thing that has, that I've grown in just honestly, probably since August. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. well, first off, congratulations on your new grandbaby. (laughs) I have to add that in there. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. I was wondering, Brooke, if, if one thing I wanted to maybe talk about was there, from the time that you found out about the infidelity, um, between your husband and, and somebody else and the time you opened your relationship to swinging, there was, sounds like there was about a 13 year window in there. Yeah. How, and I'm asking this because it's not that uncommon and we, we hear it quite a bit how did you sort of reconcile like what happened after the infidelity came up? Because it sounds you said like he, he had developed a relationship with her. It wasn't like, Oh, they randomly met and hooked up and that was it. It sounds like it was, it was more than that. So like, how did that 
play out? And then yeah. how did you reconcile that over the next couple of years to get to a point of, okay, we can like, we're going to, to do this swinging. And it sounds like you said like swinging was like, well, I'm going to do swinging so he can do this out in the open. And it almost sounds like it was out of duress in a sense, but I, I would rather you, yeah. you, you explain it than me guess at it. <laughs> yeah, I can address it. So for sure. And, and I do want to be honest about the situation with his infidelity is there, there was nothing sexual aside from kissing, but it okay. was a long-term emotional development between the two that was completely hidden. Okay. And that I think to me felt more painful than just a one night stand. And, yeah, sure. you know, there was, there was emotions involved and there was hurt feelings involved with the two of them and not being able to, you know, continue what they had developed. And I'll be very candid. It was probably 11 years of me being a complete I don't know if I can cuss B word. You can, you can, you can say bitch. I, you can say bitch I if you want to complete, say. I was a complete bitch. I punished him. I tortured him for what he did to me for about 11 years. And we got to a point where it was just so exhausting. I felt like I couldn't trust him. And I felt like he needed to do so much more to rebuild that trust that I honestly made his life a living hell because of his choice. And it took a good couple of years after I finally gave up the fact thinking he doesn't deserve to be punished this way. And I need to be supportive of the fact that he needs those outside connections. It's something that he's lacking for whatever reason. You know, we were married young. I was 17. He barely turned 19. We had our first baby three months after we were married. And, um, it, you know, it was, you hate to think this, but you feel like, God, did I trap him in this situation? And is this what he wants is somebody else? And that's why he can't be faithful. And so it took a lot of growth at that time, just for me to wrap my head around the fact that I needed to be okay. If he wanted even just female friendships, it was very tough because I felt like, okay, here we go. He's going to develop this emotional connection. It's going to be more important than I am. And it was a real struggle for 11 years. And Finally, one day it was just like, I'm done with this. I just need to move on. I can't have this affect me and consume me the way that it has. And that's when we took a really positive turn in our marriage and communication improved greatly when we started swinging because you have to have those conversations. Um, Once we got settled in that first relationship, it felt like the communication kind of got put to the side and there wasn't a lot of communication happening at that point. And in those relationships, both of those first dynamics, there was a lot of, I'm complaining to him about his partner and he's complaining to me that she's complaining to him about me. And it was just this putting him in the middle and, um, both of the husbands in both dynamics, um, were not near as mature as my husband. And so it wasn't that, his wife was complaining to him and I was complaining to him about her. My husband was the sounding board. And so he became the middleman and had a lot of pressure on him feeling like he had to fix things. And it was a lot of work and being honest, I would never go back to a quad relationship again because I don't feel like my husband has the right to choose a partner for me. And I don't feel like I have the right to choose a partner for my husband. I think we both have our rights to be involved with who is healthiest for us. And in a quad situation, I honestly feel like someone's taking one for the team. So. Yeah, mm-hmm. that makes sense. I mean, it's a, it is a very difficult dynamic. Um, and yeah, I think too, just like the, you said like your, your marriage improved greatly when you started swinging, but I think it's like, I imagine those years, those 11 years were extremely difficult for not only for you, but also for him. Like he's, he's being raked over the coals, like for something he did 11 years ago. And, yeah. and you're just holding on to the pissed off anger. Like, Absolutely God damn, like that's, I was. <laughs> that has, <laughs> that had to be just a, that had to be, I mean, it had to be a really hell of a 10 years, 11 years. It was, it was yeah, probably yeah. the roughest 10 years of my marriage, to be honest, up until 2019, when the fallout first started to happen, that's probably the first time we've actually, um, come near where both of us have said divorce. And 
it's funny to look back on it two years later now. We both comment, wow, aren't we so glad we didn't give up? Aren't we glad that we stuck it out? Um, it's funny because after his infidelity and he told me about it, I separated myself from him for about 24 hours. I didn't want to talk to him. I didn't want to see him. I didn't want to have any communication about it at all. And my first communication to him was, I forgive you, but I didn't forgive him. (laughs) Like, okay, I will say this. There is a difference between forgiving and forgetting. And at that point I thought I had forgiven, but I definitely couldn't forget. And as time went on, I realized I had not forgiven. I was punishing him for that action for a very long time. So that was a lesson learned. Um, And an interesting twist to this whole thing is we, we both grew up LDS. I had an inactive family. His family's very active. Um, Teenage pregnancy was frowned upon, obviously from the religious standpoint. Um, We had actually gotten sealed in the LDS temple at our one year anniversary and had become the picture perfect Mormon family, having lots of kids. Um, at one point I was primary president. Like we were living this life that I just thought, Oh, this is everything that I've wanted. And I've got this perfect family and, you know, I'm living this perfect relief society, primary president life. And we, it was about that time that this infidelity occurred that, should have then been a been been a big indicator to me that things weren't right. And it did take until that 11 years post for me to sit down and say, I've lived a life that somebody else dictates for me. My in-laws, not necessarily so much my husband in the aspect of the religious side of things, but um, I definitely did not make that choice for me. And so it was unsuccessful. And I'm a big believer in the fact that if you're going to be successful at something, it has to be a choice that you're making. And so we both fell away from the church. And it was shortly after that, that we had approached the idea of swinging. And so it's, it's pretty interesting being on some of these sites, the couples that you come across that you're like, Oh, but you're still going to church. (laughs) And so that was a big thing for me with my husband was, I'm not going to live two lives. I'm not going to go to church and pretend that I'm this person that I'm not and have this activity going on on the side that does not obviously fall in line with the church teachings. And so we left the church completely. And it actually, it took a few years for us to even be honest with our families about it. Um, we've, we've been honest and open with our kids from the beginning about our open lifestyle. And they've been very aware of the relationships that we've been in and are in. And we ended up actually coming clean with our families at about five years in, total five years in, because we were still with the first couple. And it caught me off guard. It was very much a I had had a family party with my family and my brother made the comment, well, we'll come as long as your friends aren't there. And he did the air quote friends. And I looked at Steve and I said, well, obviously there's some assumptions being made. We need, just need to talk about it with them. So we had talked about it with them and my husband had made a comment to his partner at the time about the friends comment. And she got extremely upset over it and, put a lot of pressure on that she wanted to be recognized as his girlfriend. And, you know, my husband's approach to it was just to put on social media. I've got a wife and a girlfriend. If you don't like it, unfriend me. That was his announcement to the world. (laughs) Mine was more, (laughs) we, it caused a big fallout. (laughs) My husband was getting unfriended left and right. I took a different approach to it. I'm very methodical and analytical and thought out in my words. And so I typed out this big like paragraph about, you know, we're choosing to live a lifestyle that is not common or recognized by many, especially in Utah, but we're choosing a lifestyle that works for us and it's not widely accepted. But for those of you who truly care about us and love us, 
you'll support us through this. And so I had a lot less falling out than my husband did. Um, but it still put a rift in my core family on my side because I didn't talk to my sister for two years because of it. Um, she didn't want to have a conversation with me. Um, my brothers had unfriended me on social media and that's really our source of, um, connection because one of them lives out of state. And so it was tough to have that disconnect from family, but in the long run, I'm a firm believer that you need to be authentic. You need to be true to yourself. And if people can't accept you for that, then they don't belong in your life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How did your kids react? Like, cause it sounds like if you, you, it sounds like you had your kids fairly soon after you and your husband got together, got married and you, you opened up 20 plus years later. So they were Older. almost adults, if not, if not adults by the time that, that this was going on. Yeah. So our kids right now range in age from 31 down to 20. And so this has been a, about 10 and a half years. And so, you know, our, our daughter was 10 at the time and our oldest son was um, almost 21, not quite. And he was engaged in getting married and actually him and his wife were married in the temple. And I've just always encouraged my kids to be non-judgmental about anybody's situation. Everybody has a story. Everybody has a reason. I've been fortunate enough that my kids have been exposed to a wide array of differences. My husband's brother that passed away was quadriplegic for 35 years. My kids have been around our friends that are gay and married to each other. And so diversity is not something that is a surprise to my kids. And I've always taught them, you accept everybody for who they are. You don't judge, you love them. Everybody's human. And so that's been something that has definitely been to our benefit with their acceptance of this. And I've always told my kids, if you don't like it, you don't have to accept it. I'm not forcing this on you. We won't require that you be at a family dinner that our partners are at. I've always given them the choice. Um, Our oldest son and daughter-in-law, they won't leave if they show up and one of our partners is there. They'll stay. They're just very reserved. Um, My oldest daughter, who is 27, she doesn't want any part of it. She doesn't want to see it. She doesn't want to hear about it. She has come over when partners have been there and um, she will get what she needs done and she'll leave. She doesn't want to stick around. And then the rest of our kids are very mindful and open to it and know our partners and have they've had great relationships with our partners in the past. Um, Brad lives about 60 miles away from me. And so I see Brad once to twice a week and it's usually him that I'm seeing and his daughter on occasion, but my kids don't see him all that often. And so he hasn't had a chance to meet all of my kids yet where former partners have had definitely had, um, a big influence on my kids' opinion of ethical non-monogamy. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is probably a, a super tough question, but where do you, where do you see yourself going in, in non-monogamy moving forward? You know, when I started out dating separately, I thought, oh, I'll date a couple of people and maybe find something that fits. And um, I met Brad and things seemed to click very well. We have very similar energies and we seem to be very good for each other. And I had dated off and on a couple of times with a few people that just didn't kind of work out or there just wasn't a connection. And honestly, with my career, my husband, Brad, I don't really have time to add to that plate. And I definitely feel like with Brad that I found a partner that this will be very long lasting because of how healthy it is and the communication level that's there. And so I don't foresee my dynamic changing anytime soon, probably for years yeah. to come, to be honest. Yeah. 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 So. Well, and it sounds like your, your husband is finding something that works a little better for him, even though like, obviously there was some struggle in finding it. Um, yes. But it, and it also, like, it sounds like he's finding what's working better for him. You found what's worked better for you. And then and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, that like you and your husband's marriage and relationship is, in a better spot. Like, is it like, 
I don't know. Do you feel like your relationship is in the best place it's been like in 30, whatever, 32 years? I would say that just the last four months. Yes. Specifically, especially now that he's finding his way and finding something that works for him. It's definitely improved even more so. And we went from, we were always believers that you don't fight in front of your children. They shouldn't know that you're at odds with each other. And so everything was always behind closed doors. And then, um, it evolved to once our kids were grown, we'd have very unhealthy discussions with one another. And in 2019, when it was, you know, both of us were saying divorce, 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 it got extremely volatile and has progressed a great deal since. So yeah, we're, we're probably in the best place we've been in our marriage in probably 25 years. And, and what do you think, like, what do you think was the contributing factor to that? Because you've been open and you've been having the hard conversations for 10 years, but something is, something is different. Hard conversations are only effective when they are received well. So I wouldn't say that that has definitely been the case for the last 10 years. I would say that the hard conversations have definitely been effective over the last six to eight months. And my husband healing from his emotional um, downfall from that last dynamic, him getting to a point of feeling healed over that has been a big contributor to that. But I think the biggest thing is, is I've transitioned from a very codependent spouse to being very independent and feeling like I finally can make choices for myself. Um, There was a quote that had come through on a meme from one of the poly pages. And it had something to do with the, to the effect of you shouldn't stay in a relationship for another person for fear that it will end multiple relationships. And I think that that's what I did in those former two relationships is I stuck it out because I didn't want, I didn't want it to be negative for my husband. I wanted him to enjoy what he had found. And so I just kind of went along with it and I wasn't truly happy And now that I'm independent and dating on my own and I found a good connection with Brad, I'm able to be more supportive and have compersion for my husband and definitely feel like being able to recognize what boundaries I need to put in place has definitely benefited my marriage a great deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the boundary setting is is such a challenge. And especially if you have 20 or 30 years or even five or 10 years of not doing it, right? Like yeah. you, and then it changes and it's, it's hard for you. It's and it's hard for the person who the boundaries, like if there really haven't been boundaries between you and your husband and all of a sudden there's a boundary and he's like, well, what the hell is this shit? Like <laughs> I've dealt with this before, That's right? Like, hard. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I yeah. don't know. Are you, are you, is there, are you able to talk to like that experience, like how you've navigated that together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think before when I would communicate with him, it came from a very defensive place because I didn't feel like I was being heard. And so there was a lot of you do this and you do that and you don't do this and you don't do that. And now it's more or less, I feel this way when you do this, it's more I statements of, this is how I'm feeling. It's nothing you've done to cause it. But when you do these actions, that's how I choose to feel. And I'm trying to choose to feel differently. Um, Chris has been huge on helping me change mindset. And when I have an initial thought process or reaction to something, I'll immediately call her and say, this is what's happening. And she'll say, okay, take a step back, take a deep breath. Let's look at it from a different mindset. And it's definitely helped me to approach those conversations with my husband on a more level headed position and not from a point of frustration or anger. And he seems to be more receptive to that, obviously. And I've learned also that the way people process things is not always going to be the way that I process. I'm very much one that has to talk through things. My husband's very much one that has to stop and distance himself and think through it. And for years, I took that as him shutting me out or something that I had done personally. What did I do? Why are you upset? Did I upset you? Did I do something wrong? 
And now I'm very much in the mindset of, well, this is his issue. And if he wants to talk about it, he'll talk about it. And if he doesn't, he'll work through it and I'm not going to worry about it. So it's definitely put me on a higher level mentally in regards to him is that I don't own his emotions and I don't try to deflect my emotions onto him and make him feel a certain way. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I, I think as you were talking, uh, it occurred to me that, you know, Chris is your metamor, but she's also, uh, close, close friend and someone, yes. and a support person to go to. Right. And it, it, it just highlighted to me the importance of having someone or multiple people in your life like that, that you can talk to about your relationships. And especially be, if you're confused or trying to figure something out and have that yes. sounding board, that's not a partner necessarily so that you can work through that and then hopefully approach those conversations with your partner differently. And the importance of having that support and that you know, it can be a metamor, it can be a friend, it can be a therapist, it can be a coach. There's so many people there or a family member. It could be a lot of people that could fill that role. But as you're talking, that really hit me of how influential that has that, that having that support has been for you. Absolutely. And I don't think it could have just been anyone because not everybody's going to understand this lifestyle. So if you have frustrations and you want to vent to them, they start to judge. Well, if you weren't in this lifestyle, you wouldn't be having that issue and you wouldn't have to communicate about this. And so it's taken finding the friend that I have in Chris, who has lived this lifestyle for so long that can put it in the proper perspective. And the other thing too about Chris is Chris is extremely accountable And she shared with me numerous times, I woke up this morning knowing you're going to Brad's tonight feeling this way. And she goes, it's not about you. It's not about Brad. It's me recognizing I'm owning my own feelings about this. Um, I usually am down at Brad's every other Tuesday. And she's like, would I ever go to Brad's on a Tuesday? No, I've got too much to do. But you were going and I was feeling envious and it's just, it's, it's refreshing to have her be open and honest and candid with me when she's struggling with something, because it shows me it's okay to have those struggles. It's about how you work through them and how you take accountability for your thoughts and your mindset. And so that's been huge. And the great thing is too, is my friendships with the former metas were very much centered around the relationship. My friendship with Chris is a standalone friendship. So regardless of what happens with Brad on either of our ends, we still have a friendship with each other that will survive. And that's been extremely refreshing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, interrupt you one second. Uh, What you said about it just can't be anyone. I agree. It has to be someone that is non-judgmental, but it could be a a different dynamic, but having them be non-judgmental and understand why you're doing what you're doing and then be supportive from that perspective is really important. Yeah, and and to the to the point of it's a standalone friendship or standalone relationship with Chris. It it kind of made me think back to your, your the statement you made um, that your husband said um, towards the end of the second quad. Uh, the <laughs> the sorry we so we've been navigating a quad ourselves, and we have some other really close friends who are in a quad. And so this is an aside. This is an aside, this total <laughs> sidebar. Um, so we have found all of these vocabulary words that we can we can change and use quad in the place. So we have like a quad nundrum is a is a problem within the quad. So anyway, at the end of the quad, um, the, the, se- the, the, the second, second quad. quad, your husband said like the rule the rules have changed. The rules of the game have changed, and. I'm just curious, like moving forward, have the rules of the game changed? It sounds like it was like, like he still wants to be with you, but he's also going to continue being in that relationship. And now it sounds like I'm just projecting and guessing like the rules of the game have probably changed for you. Like your husband's not going to tell you, you can't be with Brad and you're not going to tell your husband he can't be with his new partner. But that, that throws a wrench in where all of a sudden, like, that that doesn't mean that you two are the default anymore, right? That's sort of what happens is like, yes, we want to be together, but now we're choosing to be together every day. We're not just doing this because like we have a piece of paper that says we're married. Yeah. Um, that's one thing that I think is the biggest benefit to coming back to each other 
in our relationship, you know, after I've had a sleepover at Brad's and spent time with Brad and coming home and Steve's had time with his other partner is we recognize the benefits of what we have with each other. Um, like I said earlier on, there's needs that Steve fulfills for me and needs that he can't fulfill for me. And so I think coming back together, it definitely highlights what it is that he provides for me mentally as well as physically. And it's very different than what I am fulfilled by Brad. And so it, I think it just, it allows you to appreciate more of what your partner or spouse, primary, secondary can do for you in that individual relationship. It makes you value it more. And I would say that in my journey in ethical non-monogamy, the two former quads the unhealthiness of those has made me really value and appreciate what I have with Brad and Chris and how healthy it is. I don't take it for granted. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Makes total sense. Mm-hmm. I appreciate it. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, I know we could talk to you for hours <laughs> and keep going, yeah. um, but in the interest of not taking up your entire afternoon, do you have anything else that you would like to make sure to get out there? And maybe I should ask you first, Finn, do you have another question? My question was going to be, is there anything we haven't talked about yet that you <laughs> want to get out there? Um, it was exactly the same question. So, yes. Um, I would say that there's obviously a lot more that goes into the stories of the two unhealthy dynamics, but I'm sure. big on a lot of that, even though it's partially my story to share, it's not entirely my story to share. And so... I could go off for days on how many unhealthy and manipulative things were done. And I just, I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on the fact that I'm able to recognize how unhealthy those were and how healthy it is that I have this relationship that I've been able to find. And I would say that the number one thing that I would impart to people is don't settle. Don't go with the flow just because it's what your partner wants to do or feels comfortable doing. Make your own choices, find your own relationships. And if they work for you, it's not easy. It takes a lot of work, but it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully said. And and fantastic advice. So yeah, <laughs> thank you for that. Absolutely. And thank you for for coming on and and sharing everything and being vulnerable and talking through your story. And uh, I mean, extend the gratitude to, to your husband as well. Um, and to, and to Brad, um, thank you. And to Chris, because she she kind of <laughs> started this she, whole thing. She, she's yeah. the reason we're talking to you. So yeah, so thank you to Chris. I know she's listening. And um, yeah, just thank you for being here and for for sharing your journey and for all the like the hard ass work you've done over the last ten plus years. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. It's yeah. it's an amazing lifestyle with a lot of positives. If you can find the right healthy relationship for you, it's totally worth it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love yeah. It. I yeah. Love it. Yeah. And we look forward to hopefully hearing an update in a little while, <laughs> how thank things are you. going as well. So yeah. thank you again. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank and, you. Um, we'll be in touch. Thank you. And we're back. You were going to do it and then you stopped. I know, another head fake. <laughs> Thank you, Brooke, for coming on the show and sharing your story. And for Chris for putting us in touch with Brooke, too. It's amazing. We're so glad and excited to get these stories out there. Yes. <laughs> you don't have anything else to add? <laughs> I agree with everything you say, Emma. Perfect. Now we have that on record. <laughs> yeah. I can't I can't be the change I wish to see in your world if I'm not willing to do it myself. That's true. That's true. Anyway, just a quick reminder that we do have a bunch of virtual events and in-person events coming up. Go For more information, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the community events tab. You'll find all of the details there as well as also on our website, you'll find links to to our favorite affiliate partners uh, on the resources tab, as well as podcast show notes. Yes, Emma, I agree with everything. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Okay. Next, Next week. <laughs> high five. Next week, we have an amazing interview with Hannah and Greg coming to us all the way from, you know what? A time zone in North America further east than East Coast time. Yeah, that's true. So we're excited for that. Uh-huh. 
I don't know why I thought that was so exciting. I, I don't know either. I didn't know where you were going with that. But. Well, I learned about a new time zone when we did this it's one. It's true. It's true. Maybe people think I'm an idiot now, but I don't know geography. <laughs> Well, there you have it, folks. Uh, So, yeah, super amazing interview and fantastic conversation. We will see you all next week for that. And in the meantime, send us an email, send us a voicemail, let us know what you think, and we will let you know what we think of what you think. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening.